Oh, hey. Good morning. I have to stop doing this thing. You know, I have, a, I have a friend, Marty. Yeah. And the running joke is that she cannot make that sound. Really? She can't make it. She goes. <laughs> uh, I'm a little too good at it and a little too much of a dork. I go all the time. <laughs> Excited. Anyway, good morning. Welcome to Coffee Chat on a Friday morning. Awesome yeah. to be here. So it's Friday again, and it's now fall. It's September. Yeah. And uh, Tara, what? we have been doing Coffee Chat now for quite a while, long enough that in my memories on Facebook, I'm getting memories of, hey, this was happening a year ago. This was happening 18 months ago. So we should revisit some of those old coffee chats just to see what we were, you know, what we were, what were we rambling about last September? Well, I know we had like giant spreadsheet going, the coffee chat spreadsheet that was all the topics. And it's true. We have a spreadsheet. You are right. We did. We were very organized. I think now we've just moved that organization out of a spreadsheet. Now we have notes and we've got everything online. We share it with our, our fans. It's just done a little differently. But, um, I, see, I see you have a couple of banners here. I have a couple of banners, a couple of things I thought we might talk about today. Um, first of all, as people roll in, the thing that we like to know is on a scale of one to 10, how is your rowing week going? So if you're with us and you're following and you can leave a comment, let us know scale of one to 10 and why what's happening where you are in your rowing world. I think I'm going to give mine a seven. The rowing was really good. Um, you know, kinky, but it worked and not in the fun way, but like <laughs> kinky in the, um, you know how you have this feeling in an eight when you know someone's just like, oh, well, I'll just be the training wheel. Oh, yeah. You have this feeling that like three seat has just resigned themselves. Mm -hmm. And if you don't fight the entire time for a set boat and to pre be precise, there's a there's an element of sus sustaining a fight, right? Yeah. Or sustaining an effort, you know, in an eight. And that's tiring. And some people just don't have it. And some people don't know how to fix stuff. So mm -hmm. I my and so this boat was pretty good. Um, we're really good at 26, like, but we've been working at 22, 24, 26 long pieces. And um, but I'm having a hard time with one of my teammates mm -hmm. who yells and talks during pieces on the water. And you don't have a coach, right, really with you most of practice to kind of shut that down. No, but it's the culture of the club. Yeah. It's nothing I can do yeah. except manage my own big feelings about it. You know, it, it really bothers me. There's such a lack of high fives mm -hmm. and camaraderie. And then this person is like barraging mm -hmm. the people in the bow. Is like, that? Is that yeah, telling them to do things? So they think they're being helpful and probably feel that they can do that because there isn't a coach. There's no one. Ma and I, you know, I, I, I struggle because, you know, I would like to say something. I said something to the rower who felt affected by it and was like, you know, Leo was yelling at me and then the coach was coaching me. And then the coxswain says a lot because the coach is not there. Yeah. She's like, I just shut down. Mm -hmm. Like I had this coming from behind me. I had this coming from the launch. I had this coming from the coxswain and then the pressure. And then she's going through some personal stuff and she's like, yeah. I just shut down. Yeah. And I said, you know, I used to teach my learn to row students to turn around to that person and say, thank you. But I need, and just yeah. how to say it politely and kindly mm -hmm. and just yeah. say, it's not, not today, not yeah. today, you know, but but that didn't bother me as much the other day as it did yesterday because the other day she just yelled this one thing at like the three quarter of the way mark. Mm -hmm. I heard like full sentences and we're supposed to be at like full press. Yeah. 
piece. Yeah. Full sentences. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. That, that's hard because you've got someone who probably thinks that they're being helpful, doesn't understand that it can be distracting or detrimental. Know your wake, people. Know no your wake. And also, yes, if you are supposed to be working, then work. And if you're spending your effort and energies and breath on speaking full sentences to the rowers three seats ahead of you, you're not tuned into what you're doing. No. Yeah. I mean, but this is the same group of people who, when they go hands on and they're carrying the boat, I'm yeah. like, yeah. I mean, that's, that's sacred to me. Like you don't talk when you're carrying a boat. Like, yeah, this makes me think, is this ro is this particular person also just like quite a talker off the water? And this is just a piece of her personality. I Maybe, maybe that's yeah. a good way of putting it is that she's a talker, but, um, but I'm saying all of the people oh. talk when they carry oh, everybody. Yeah. So it's part of the culture. And I'm yeah. like, Ooh, that's like sacred to me. Like, what if the coxswain needs you to do something like right on the spot? Yeah. You're carrying however many thousands of dollars worth of stuff. I was yeah. just schooled that like, as soon as you arrive at practice and you're done with your socializing, when the hand is on the boat to the end of practice, you are rowing and that is it. Like you yeah. can say, look at the birdie when you've stopped, but none of this like. Yeah. So, so this is really interesting. This kind of is, yeah, yeah, this, this is a good segue because I'm going to put this up here. Okay. Here's the thing. I, I am um, a thousand percent on board with you. You get to the boathouse. Basically, once you're there, your time should be spent warming up, getting in the headspace for practice. Now, I'm not saying don't talk to anyone. Like you go there to socialize. So that's fine. But certainly once the coach has started practice, you're listening to the coach. Once coaches said get hands on and you're with your coxswain and the coxswain is taking command, like, you know, that your headspace is here and thinking about what's happening. Yeah. Drop it out, folks. Like, yeah. Um, what houses do that, though? You know? Yeah, no, not everyone does. And um, this is something that I have been thinking about a lot this season with the club program that I'm coaching. It's a different beast than working with a competitive program. You know, people are there to socialize, to get in a good workout. And mm -hmm. I have to, as a coach, kind of let go of some of the like hard and fast rules that I've had. But Okay, so here's a thing that I'm not sure I've talked with you yet about Tara, but I have a certain way of coaching that involves a lot of feedback on the water while they're rowing, while they're not rowing. There's just, I don't want to say constant, but there is feedback given so that we don't form bad habits. Right. I uh, was told this week to my face post-practice with the entire team listening that I talk too much. So the next practice I went to, I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. I had a megaphone. I did not say a word. I was with a second coach. That coach did some coaching, but I kept my mouth shut. Not that that's how I always want to lead practices now, but for me, it was a way of saying, all right, well, if you don't want to hear me, <laughs> then this is what your practice is like. Oh, my gosh. You could take that all kinds of directions. I mean, yeah. you could say you could have a practice and be directly talking to that person at practice on the boat. I mean, there's all ways you could do it. And you could just be like, is this too much? Have I said too much? Is this too much? Okay, great. Awesome. Anybody else? Too much? Too little? <laughs> What's going on? Anybody want any feedback? You tell me. Yeah. You know, but you have to be careful because they are the customer, right? Yes. They're a paying customer. Yeah. And maybe they're not saying that you're talking too much. Maybe they're saying they're not talking, you're not talking in a way that's productive for them, particularly. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, well, what would you, you could just go back and say, what would you like me to do? Yeah. Yeah. 
That's a good point. I could, I could, we could have that sort of a conversation. Yes. Well, it's more like what's helpful for you. Yeah. Because, you know, there are people who are really overstimulated in the rowing environment yeah. and they look at me and you can see that they're glazed over. They're not yeah. listening anymore. So, yeah. And I, I think, know. yeah. And this goes back to what you were saying just now about being in your lineup, having a coach potentially talking from the launch, having the coxswain talking, possibly somebody else in the boat talking. And that can be really overwhelming for people in the boat. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, for, for me in the launch, you know, I do my best to listen for the coxswain and not overlap with the coxswain, make sure that there's some space given between when the coxswain is talking and when I'm talking and making sure that we're not duplicating, like I'm not duplicating what the coxswain is saying. Um, so it's been an interesting week. I think I'm, I'm trying to get into that space where I'm providing some constructive uh, feedback, but also giving the crew time to, as Tyler and I are talking about it this week, Tyler's the other coach, we're talking about it being, you know, feel, listen, feel, listen, there's a third thing, you know, but, but basically back to the basics and coaches, yeah. coaches quiet down a little bit. The other thing to consider, and I had this happen on Tuesday was I felt like the coxswain was like calling me out on purpose for, cause I have a tendency when I, when my mind wanders a little bit, I tend to rush the top, top six inches. Right. And it felt like she didn't give me enough time to check myself and to fix it. Mm -hmm. It's like immediately on me. And like the second my head went out of the boat and I, and I did something, she was on it. And my coach who I mentored with Eleanor would say, you got to, whatever you're looking at, you got to watch it for five strokes continuously to see if it's actually a problem or if it was just a bubble. Yeah. You know? And so to see the same thing applies with like, application of what they're telling you as a coach like you got to give me like 10 strokes to actually do what you're saying i'm, yeah. I'm supposed to be doing right yeah well, right the, the rowers have to absorb what you've said and then figure out how to fix it and then work on fixing it and then you have to circle back and say yeah. yes no maybe almost you know all yeah. of all of that stuff i have to say i was really proud of myself that we did a big piece yesterday and Lisa, the coxswain, always calls me out for that. Like, just, you know, I get it. I get it. I, I know I have a tendency to, like, kind of ramp up. But I'm I'm five seat. So sometimes you feel the bow four kind of rushing you. Yeah. You're trying to hold them back. And so yeah. there's an effect. I am very proud of myself. She didn't say anything to me once about it during the entire 20-minute piece. So good. good on, you know, I mean, there's some progress, you know, it's just something I work on, but I just think coaches need to give people five strokes. Yeah. Just pay attention. Well, I'm yeah. sorry that it happened and I'm sorry that it was out. It was so out in the, into the whole room. I mean, that's, that's a power play right there. That's a well, I, I think that, so here's how it came out. What I've been doing at the end of practices recently is we circle up do a little, you know, re rehash of practice. And then I've asked rowers to offer up one good thing that they could pull from practice, whatever that might be. And a couple of people had said different things, whatever it was, the boat was set. I really like this drill. And then this one rower said, and you didn't talk as much today. <laughs> and I said, oh, so it was good that I didn't talk as much today. He said, yeah, that was great. <laughs> he told him, and I don't think that he meant it in a harmful way, but he was real honest about it. So, um, you know, in a way, I'm kind of glad that it came out that way because it just was a little bit of a shock to me. And I had yeah. to check myself um, and understand how my coaching affects people. You know, I don't, I'm not 100% the best coach out there. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. Um, on the flip side, I had a I had a rower at the end of last week tell me that I was awesome. So you know, it all balances out. <laughs> yeah, you gotta take them both, right? Yeah. yeah. Um. So if you're watching today, welcome to Coffee Chat. I'm Tara. This is Rachel. And tell us where you're watching from and how your rowing week's going. Um. We had a fun week here at Study State. Yeah. 
did. On Monday, we got to talk with Pete and Dick Dreisegacker, brothers and co-founders of Concept2. And yeah. I, have to tell, I have to tell you guys that we do, we do the interviews on Zoom. And before we let them into the Zoom room, Tara and I were like <laughs> a little bit nervous. Uh, these two guys, Pete and Dick, know their stuff. They're, they're um, big wigs in the rowing community. Uh, everybody knows concept to oars and indoor rowers. And we were really excited to talk to them about their rowing origin stories and obviously talk to them about the business. And uh, we kind of took a deep breath, welcomed them, and then we just started talking and they were so generous. We talked to them for like an hour and a half. Yeah, it was it was a while. It was good. It was good. Yeah. Uh, and they were just lovely, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I think the way that you and I talk about rowing and say that we can talk about rowing all day, I mean, so do they. <laughs> they come at it from a different perspective than us, but rowing really is in their blood and it's their entire lives. And um, something that I thought was fascinating was to find out that to this day, 45, 50 years since they started the business, the two of them, are still on a regular basis the ones testing their oars. They hop in a pair up there in Vermont. They go yeah. out for a swing row. And um, I mean, they've got, I can't remember what they're called. I really should know right now, but the speed meters that go on the oars and uh, they've got their whole system. And sometimes they'll pull in a younger rower to test out the oars, but it's these two guys who are 60 something and 70 something. Mm -hmm. Right. Testing, testing their oars to decide what's going to go on the market that we end up with uh, in all of our boathouses across the country. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, it, it was incredible conversation just because they're so engaging, you know, I mean, especially Pete and, and um, just the stuff that you don't think about, like the, where the, where the phrase concept two came from, like where the name came from was yeah. that Pete was doing, uh, had a master's research project and he was going to explore concept one or concept two. Yeah. And that was like, that's, that's it. Nothing, nothing more spectacular than that. And they're like, yeah, yeah, working on a, yeah, working on a grad school project. And he had four or five concepts of what yeah. he wanted to do a project on. And he settled on concept two was the one that he was going to do his project on. And, uh, you know, instead of naming their first business, Dries the Gack or Ors, it, it was concept two. Although they did have a product on the market that had dry scacker on it. I think you're right. They're, I think they're earliest ores. Yeah, yeah. Which um, I love to say the word dry scacker. Dry scacker. I really want to know what that means, actually. I kind of want to look that up. I'm well, sure. Dry is three. D-R-E-I is three. So it might be something related to three. Three, three something. It would be hilarious if it meant concept two. <laughs> concept three. <laughs> Yeah, so that episode comes out uh, tonight for our patrons and tomorrow for the public. Um, hope you enjoy it. It's a long one. Yeah, yeah. And our, so our podcast is available on our website, SteadyStateNetwork.com, as well as any of your favorite uh, podcast apps. And you can ask your smart speaker to play Steady State Podcast. Uh, truthfully, that's not a thing that I do very often, but once in a while I do, and I just kind of get a kick out of it. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fun. <laughs> Yeah, so um, thanks to our sponsors, Concept2 and Lake Washington Rowing Club. Uh, they sponsor the podcast, and they're going to be helping us out. I have a question for the populace. What is the length of a standard uh, sweep bore in centimeters? Oh, centimeters? Well, that's how they measure it, in centimeters. Right, right. Um, we, need, we need to put in our order today, and I need to know... Um, Oh, for both. So here's the scoop. This is super exciting. So for our director's challenge, mixed eight that we're rowing ahead of the Charles, Concept 2 is being amazing and has offered us a set of oars for the eight. I thought it was just going to be any old set of oars, but they have generally, generously offered to make us a set of oars to spec. 
So we're determining length and the type of handle we're going to get, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, but we're going to do, I think we're going to end up doing green on green, um, the split handle, which uh, is great. But the or length, um, I want to say 160. I, I did some research yeah. and um, if anybody knows about this kind of thing um, or spell oh, I thought maybe you had to answer there with you this standard. Somewhere between 362 and 378 centimeters is is uh, the adjustable ores. Sculling yeah. are 274 to 292. Oh, oh, you know what number I was thinking about? I was thinking about inboard, oh. not the overall length. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 362 to 378, um, I would imagine uh, I'm going to end up having them tell us what they what we should get because, sure. you know. Do we have everybody's height mm -hmm. for the whole crew? Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the it's cool. They're, so they're generously donating, making these oars for us. And then our boat, our craft is going to be a beautiful shell from Wintech. Um, we've sent them our specs of how big we are and how tall we are and, yeah. and all of that. So yeah, just working that out. So thanks to Wintech for sponsoring um, this boat. It's a very special boat. It's a it's a boat that's about inclusion. It's a, you know, trans, trans ally, LGBTQA uh, boat. Probably the first to sort of blast that it's doing that going down the Charles. Certainly not the first going down the Charles. But <laughs> Sorry. The I'm just thinking about blasting. Like we should have some music that's like, like some party music. Yeah. <laughs> we are family. Yeah, down the course. Um, yeah, so it's very exciting. We're going to have a big message about inclusion and um, challenging the gender norms of rowing. And, you know, I had a conversation with a mom yesterday. I was cutting her hair and her child is non-binary and is a coxswain. Hmm. And I said, you know, when you come to think of it, everything else about rowing is gendered except coxswains. Mm -hmm. Coxswains can be in any combination of boat. You know, they don't have to be, they can be in a traditionally mixed male, female, you know, whatever in, in the categories. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool that the coxswains aren't gendered. They are not gendered. Although I feel like it has been traditional for girls and female identifying to be in female identifying boats and vice versa. <laughs> I haven't seen that as much at the collegiate level though. Cause like, Mm. My friend Rasta got recruited as the Columbia heavyweight men's coxswain. Yeah, you, know? you definitely see women coxing men's boats. But you are totally right. I love that it's not set in stone. It's certainly not a rule. And right. it definitely gives a spot for trans athletes to be involved without gender being really a consideration. Yeah, it's definitely... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it because she was concerned because Bo, her kid is is very tiny and mighty, like super tiny and mighty. And I was like, you know, Bo could like go to college and be, um, you know, be a champ coxswain and and row, you know, in high school, obviously not mm -hmm. just college, but um, but they were really excited to hear that coxing is not as ge not gendered, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, there's men's coxing and women's coxing, you know, there's yeah. just coxing. Just yeah. When I was out in um, Oakland a couple weekends ago for East Bay Rowing Club's Bow Without Barriers, one of my coxswains approached me uh, and right off, the, like barely before even saying hello, introduced herself and said, I'm a trans coxswain and I want to cox for DC Stroke sometime. <laughs> what the follow-up though that I thought was hilarious was I'd love to cox with you sometime if you want me and can pay for me to join you somewhere I would love to do that and I was like okay sounds good but what I didn't want to say was you know I don't know where you're coming from where people pay for you to travel I mean some clubs with their own coxswains will help with travel funds but yeah, we always paid for our coxswain's entire trip to Boston. You know? Yeah, so they're right for big ones like Boston Nationals. I think there's help with 
right. just funds, but just for like some average regatta around the corner, like I, I, I think oftentimes coxswains are fending for themselves to get themselves around. I think she thinks DC Strokes is, is a bigger organization than it is. Yeah, and it has been. To, yeah. You know, to to be fair, it has been. Right now, it's a pretty small club, and I think that there may have been a time where we might be able to do that for something big like Nationals or Boston. Um, but I suggested maybe she come out um, for um, for our regatta Stonewall next June. That's our big push, like get people to Stonewall next summer. Yeah. Um, oh. Two seconds, and then I don't need to talk about DC Strokes anymore. But uh, DC Strokes just wrapped up a three-ish week campaign fundraising campaign um, mm -hmm. to raise funds for a new scholarship to help LGBTQ rowers, coaches, and coxswains uh, basically get training and get on the water. And we did that by selling T-shirts. And I designed this one, and I. Just got it in the mail. I'm so excited about it. That's so cute. I <laughs> love to cut the cake. So That's so stinking cute. Thank you. That one was a top seller. I'm so excited. We uh, ended up getting over a hundred orders from across the country, and that cut the cake drill uh, T-shirt and tank is going to end up on um, lots of boats uh, and at a lot of practices all over the U.S. So that's exciting. That's so exciting. I love that. I want one of those shirts. Cut the cake. This is not a drill. This is so <laughs> um, I love that. Um, and I love that they raised money and they were successful. Yeah, yeah it was a very successful fundraising campaign. And uh, the shop is going to remain open on the DC Strokes website. Um, because, you know, why, why not? We'll continue selling those throughout the year. Yeah, yeah. Um, what else is going on? So we've got there? one uh, little bit of news, which is we just uh, set up our next podcast episode, and we're going to be talking with the founder and president of Row for the Cure, which I'm really excited about. And this is someone that you've known for a while, right? Yeah. So this is Kathy Frederick, and I actually didn't know as much as I uh, now know about her um, up until yesterday or two days ago when I started sort of fishing around. So September is tr traditionally Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, I know I've done a lot of events like the Avon Three Day and the Row for the Cure and the Run for the Cure and Race for the Cure, or whatever you want to call it, um, over the years. And Row for the Cure here in Seattle is in September. It's usually like the third Sunday in September. And it's um, what I would call an exhibition head race. Um, it's not competitive, you know, it's not head to head. There's costumes involved. There's boat decorating that happens. There's tutus, there's wigs. I wrote it in a, in a pink wig one time in a four. And I remember my shoe, my foot came out of my shoes and I was stroking. Oh no. <laughs> That's bad. Um, Anyway, so it's this big event. It's really festive. It's really fun. It's really meaningful. I had a dear friend die of breast cancer um, bef right before she turned 40. You know, she spent nine years battling it. We mm. all battled it with her. And so it was very personal for us. And um, I used to wear, as I used to cox it. So I would teach my learn to row class and then I would cox their eight for row for the cure. Yeah. And I would wear this pink cape that said n on it for my friend noel who had passed away oh i love that so it was flapping in the breeze you know behind us yeah. um so anyway so kathy fredericks turns out was a you know just a regular master's rower had learned to row and then um got breast cancer and thought hey maybe i could raise some money using rowing and she's down in portland she's based in portland at oregon and um she created this because there's all these other for the cure events, you know, race for the cure, mm -hmm. all these things. Um, and so she created this event and it's become this huge thing. And it's, it's yeah. heavily volunteer run. What I love about it is um, not only the racing, but boat houses go up against each other to see who can raise the most money. Clubs go up against each other. And the winner of who, who raises the most money wins an urn for their boat mm -hmm. house. And it, 
it's appropriately colored uh, pink with the Road for the Cure logo and all of that. So she's, I reached out to her and she's super excited um, to come on the show. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to meeting her and talking with her and finding out more about Row for the Cure. And I know that besides the one there in Seattle, there are Row for the Cure events across the country. So um, maybe you can find out what the schedule is this year and um, see if we can get some people excited to go to some of those events. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to look at what the date is. Um, but she's great. And she's I, I'm really curious about how this has affected her life going from whatever, I'm sure she had a regular job and still has a regular job. And then this mm -hmm. is kind of tapping onto it, but it's a massive event. It's, it's, it's a big event. Well, it's all really and, Right. And we should say that that's a big piece of why we want to talk to her is we're really curious about um, not just establishing the regatta, but hosting regattas and kind of getting into the meat of what all that involves. I know a lot of boathouses have questions about how do, how do I do this for the first time? There's so many logistics involved in planning and running regatta. So we're going to pick her brain a bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. The experience of setting up a regatta. I mean, the, the bear boats without barriers, people can definitely attest to um, how complicated it can be. Like all the logistics um, from branding to registration, to yeah. tray of, to umpires, to safety, to, you know, all the things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll find out what her story is and how Road for the Cure came to be. Yeah, sounds good. And we're talking to her next Wednesday with that episode coming out about a week and a half after that. Yeah. And um, by all means, hey guys, we uh, can't do this without you. So if you know of an interesting rower, coach, coxswain, admin in the rowing world who's doing interesting unique things or you know maybe not unique things but doing those things really well or in a different sort of way uh we're looking to talk to them we want to know their stories and we want to share their stories um through our podcast so uh please you know drop us a line you can get in touch with us through our website or our socials and um, your ideas and your stories really are what make up steady state network and the podcast Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So yeah, let us know if you know anybody great we should interview. Also who we should do next for our club spotlight. Um, mm -hmm. A great club. We usually talk to a board president and a recent learn to row graduate and, you know, a coach, you know, just get to know everybody. Yeah. All right. Great. It's 32 minutes in. 30 minutes in, which means that we wrap it up. So thank you everybody for joining us today. If you are watching this after the fact, thank you for finding us and watching. We really appreciate it. And uh, stick in touch, stick in touch, stay in touch. <laughs> Have a good weekend. <laughs> and uh, hopefully we'll see you back here next Friday for another edition of Coffee Chat. All right. High fives. <laughs> Have a good one. Bye, everybody.